Good evening, everyone. I think we can begin. It's 5.10. A warm welcome to everyone who have joined us on the day two of Thesis Open Day, version seven. In today's session, we'll be looking into two categories, bird habitat and urban commons. Uh, we have uh, Sandeep Menon and Shilpa Chandavarkar Ma'am as our panel members who will be joining us again today. They were with us yesterday as well. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have Aditi Raj, who will be taking over as moderator of today's session as well. Hi, Aditi. Hi, Warm welcome to you. And Thank over you. to you, Aditi. Yeah. So, welcoming everyone to the second uh, session of Thesis Open Day. And uh, we would like to extend our appreciation to Isola Bangor team for putting together this effort. Uh, of getting it us, uh, getting to us online so we can view it from the comfort of our cities. Um, like Rashmi briefly mentioned about the three categories, landscape revival, urban commons, and bird habitats. It was spread across two days, and we are done with landscape revival yesterday. Um, it was something which is a recurring theme and a topic which we could come across in academia as well as the professional field. And the idea was um, explored and contextualized yesterday in the projects that we came across um, by re-establishing the identities. So moving forward today, uh, just to brief the new joinees, um, the structure of thesis open day will be similar to that of yesterday, where we have four presenters, one after the other, and post which we'll take it up with the panelists and take up the questions from audience. So request the audience to keep the audio and video off so the presenters and the panelists can be heard clearly without any disturbances. Um, just want to be clear that this is not a jury, so we'll not be critiquing and nitpicking on the projects. So the objective of the platform is to encourage discussions and dialogues in the first place and the possibilities that arise from these conversations. So now this is the broad based structure that we are going to follow. And each participant will have 15 minutes. So please stick to the timings, just like what we did yesterday, so we can finish it in the timeline that we're thinking about. So the first act today is the category urban commons. Uh, as a continuation from yesterday, it deals with the realm of curating neighborhoods, strategizing through people, and people participation being the mode of vision. Uh, looking at Palestinian psychology or even the traditional systems, uh, that they're looking at. Uh, we have termed this as urban commons because of the built and the unbuilt component that they're looking into in the urban setting. So our first presenter for today is uh, Ms. Tulsi Bharadwaj. She has a Bachelor's of Architecture uh, from Indira Gandhi Delhi Technical University for Women. And she'll be presenting her thesis, Interdependence of Urban Process to Achieve Sustainability. It's a design approach for a mixed use Nala friend development in New Delhi. She's aiming at reimagining the urban built environment as an interdependent ecosystem. So over to you, Tulsi. You can start the presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, is this uh, presentation visible? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Tulsi Bharadwaj, and uh, the topic of my thesis uh, is uh, the interdependence of urban processes to achieve sustainability, a design approach for a mixed use Nala front development in New Delhi. Imagine a built environment as an interdependent ecosystem. So uh, the thesis is in two parts. The first is where I analyze the urban processes of New Delhi to establish an interdependent working framework and then use that theory to establish a design solution for a mixed use Nala front community. So uh, the basic idea that laid the foundation of this thesis is the fact that uh... oh, sorry. Can you put it on slide show to we'll see? Uh... Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I actually did it was not visible. I think I'll just do that. Uh, I'll reshare. Uh, is it is it uh, uh okay is it okay now? Yes, it is. 
thank you yes, okay thank you ma'am uh, so right um so um the basic idea that laid the foundation of uh, my thesis is the fact that uh, a complex city like new delhi can be perceived as an uh, ecosystem that houses many interdependent urban processes which essentially uh, can be thought of as an analogy to any and every naturally occurring ecosystem like for example the most basic elements of a natural ecosystem are producers consumers decomposers which depend upon one another by various relationships of which essentially depicts the natural order of sustainability similarly a city can be perceived as an uh, urban ecosystem with its major components being natural ecologies urban architecture and people now uh, this problem framework establishes the fact that these components are dependent on one another and the issues that the city of new delhi today faces is uh, like uh, faces emerge from the fact that uh, the design uh, processes that uh, are followed in delhi they are largely monodisciplinary in nature and have very little involve involvement of two of the major components of this uh, ecosystem and hence the resulting city fabric is not sustainable so uh, this project proposes a hypothesis which is uh, uh, called as the urban interdependency ecosystem model for the target city of new delhi which establishes the interdependencies among various processes of the three earlier identified components analogous nature of urban processes to mimic the idea of natural mechanism of sustainability wherein the system is a closed loop and uh, it represents the uh, significance of ecologically uh, and economically and uh, socially sustainable design strategies in achieving that process so uh, moving on to the area of interest within uh, delhi so the site lies towards southwestern part of the city in the predominantly residential uh, area of the dwarka sub city the site is uh, uh, complex and it is layered with five major parameters that make it suitable for implementing the proposed urban interdependency ecosystem model uh the site uh, lies within an urban area adjoining a nala or a drain which uh, currently uh, is uh, like where currently fragmented urban development is observed uh, one of the major public infrastructural components that is present is the delhi metro that also signifies the potential of the site to act as a transit oriented development node as well so uh, coming to the immediate context of the site it's a 10 hectares or 25 acres worth of site area adjoining what is called uh, the palam nala that is essentially a sub drain of the major uh, the najafgarh nala or more accurately the ancient river sahibi which is uh, which originates in the aravallis uh, but when it enters uh, new delhi it is essentially a sewer drain so uh, the analysis then uh, began by studying various urban layers to understand the site character uh, the figure ground uh, establishes the urban density and the built uh, built use depicts the predominant residential and institutional nature of the site surroundings uh the topography analysis depicts uh, an almost outcrop like formation on site that uh, creates a level difference of about 11 meters at the two ends of the site and is it is eventually sloping towards the nala water body uh the urban edge analysis gives insights uh, regarding the existing edge character and site circulation so uh, these are some of the uh, edge sections uh, to understand and identify the typical conditions Uh, then an ecological analysis was conducted uh, with parameters being uh, the tree cover density the typical situation of waste laden nala water body and identification of tree species that are present on site so it is it was found that the heavily degraded yet rem remnant riparian edge of the nala also houses the species considered as an ecological pest for new delhi's native ecology which is the prosopis juniflora uh the final uh, like activity mapping was the final layer which visualizes the processes of the community and their interaction with the site as various times in each day these are the the series of diagrams which uh, represent the same so uh, to synthesize all the analysis layers and identify opportunities and constraints of the site this diagram was prepared which provides information regarding the site suitability and proposes zones like the intense development nexus landscape and it identifies street as a social space the connection uh, to strong existing urban context and the overall uh, potential conservation areas um uh, the ecological master planning framework aims at arranging the site with emphasis on areas of conservation and potential ecological regeneration then uh, creating mobility connectors and uh, achieving an overall uh, open space framework that integrates the various processes of natural ecologies urban architecture and people the earlier three identified uh, parameters uh, which are happening on site The following series of diagrams represents the stage-wise site development. The first, uh, guided by the areas of conservation, then uh, establishing an urban green infrastructure framework, uh, 
<laughs> then identifying a sustainable urban design framework, uh, judicial land use planning for horizontal as well as vertical mixed use communities, and a sustainable built use planning. So uh, this is the master plan of the sustainable mixed use uh, community, which uh, essentially is a manifestation of the idea of imagining a city as an interdependent ecosystem at a neighborhood level. So the mixed use community has various building typologies like institutional, culture, cultural, retail, residential, and commercial, which were pl planned in the form of both horizontal and vertical uh, typology of uh, mixed use. Uh, the site section shows the green infrastructure proposed to manage on-site stormwater uh, in the form of an upland planting zone, and then a biosoil network among uh, various other uh, pervious areas, which were integrated or uh, stitched into the development. This is the second section, which also uh, represents uh, the idea of incorporating the level difference, the existing level difference that was uh, present on site. Uh, so uh, the next part was uh, uh, like proposing various low intensity development strategies at the Nalha waterfront to provide an ecologically viable solution with minimum impact. So the diagrams on uh, the right hand side are essentially area detailed diagrams which uh, represent the specific points along the uh, entire length of the Nalha waterway and uh, how uh, like uh, low intensity development strategies are used to achieve uh, ecological uh, ecologically viable yet flexible spaces. So the next was the seasonal uh, character of the master plan. So New Delhi uh, receives a uh, heavy uh, monsoon season and uh, integrating the uh, stormwater management and uh, essentially a flood uh, prevention strategy was uh, critical to uh, this uh, existing context. And this, these diagrams shows uh, like the overall strategy, how this can be achieved at the waterfront. So uh, the further landscape details regarding the site's green infrastructure were carried out. Uh, proposed areas include a connected bioswell network, uh, recreational fields, uh, riparian zones, and a low-lying infiltration area, which uh, are essentially acting as uh, sponges for the entire site. Uh, and that along with all the uh, water calculations to uh, give a cohesive uh, stormwater management uh, planning strategy. So uh, the placemaking strategies integrates the people's perception of a space and identify it as a place. These are the diagrams which uh, will focus on the overall strategies uh, regarding placemaking that are followed in the project. And uh, then the project was uh, finally uh, concluded with both physical and digital visualizations. Uh, the left images uh, shows the first physical model with the larger context uh, originally developed at a 1 is to 1000 scale. And then the images on right uh, shows the design solution at 1 is to 500 in which the design layers uh, were visualized with various lighting types. Uh, finally, this uh, slide represents some of the site views and establishes that uh, such sustainable urban spaces can be potentially achieved if we perceive the urban built environment to be a part of the larger ecosystem in which the anthropogenic elements are now an integral part whose uh, processes must be understood as interdependencies to realize the potential of the profuse bounty that our rivers and our lands are. So uh, with that, I conclude the presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Tulsi. Uh, we just noticed how to synthesize it. I think there was some issue with the presentation being, you know, like uh, going at a different speed. Uh, we're sorry for that. We don't know what exactly was happening. Uh, but through her presentation, we understood that through synthesis and analysis of layers of opportunities and constraints, um, one can draw inferences which can cater to environmental, economic, and social aspect of the design strategy. Um, similar to naturally occurring system, the basic elements of a natural ec ecosystem are either producers, consumers, and decomposers, where they're mutually dependent on each other and they feed off each other. So she was trying to get something uh, related to that in her project as well. So we have come to an end of the category of urban commons. And in both the projects, um, there was eco regulatory approach by understanding varied biological and sociological layers. And the non-negotiable areas like the conservation zo uh, zones acted as the base and they guided for their zoning. And now moving on to um, the category bird habitats, we have three presenters in this category. It deals with the realms of wetlands where the birds prefer 
them as breeding grounds because of their rich and diverse flora and fauna. They hold a lot of importance other than just being breeding grounds. So they act as carbon sinks and also as sponges and sediment traps for regulating the floods. And there is an importance to write them and these projects are going to depict the same. So our first presenter in this category for today is Ms. Anuja Patin. And she has a master's in landscape architecture from SEPT University, Ahmedabad. She'll be presenting her thesis, Garud Ghar, Protecting the Protector and Ecological Restoration for Weaving the Mosaic. Her project is about protecting the habitat of eagle that was culturally revered and acted as a protector for the humans. The script hence looks at the idea of reciprocity and brings forth in attempting to protect the protector. So on I'm like uh, on to you, Anuja, you can pick it up now. Thank you. I'll be presenting my screen. I hope the screen is visible. Yes. It is. Sir. So, good evening. The project Garud Ghar is about protecting the habitat of eagle because it has ecological significance, social relevance, and its restoration would generate economy through low impact development. This was done by the method of ecological restoration by looking at the larger system and intervening at the node to strengthen the parental system. The study region is the watershed of Vahindra River. It is located in the coastal region of the Northern Western Ghats between the hills and the sea as one can see in these images. The site has few traces of the remnant or parental landscape that act as repositories of the native species and are anchor points for the fauna that help in sustaining within these changed landscape. To understand these habitat, uh, the habitat of parental flora and fauna was looked at and the change from the climax condition in the past to present was understood in the coastal as well as the forest ecosystem. The mangrove scrub forest has been dominated by casuarina and prosperous juliflora vegetation, and the forest has changed from tropical moist deciduous to teak dominated forest. This understanding helped in mapping the habitat of keystone and vulnerable species. Amongst these, the white bailed sea eagle was chosen as a species because of its wide home range and because it directly depends on the coastal and the terrestrial ecosystem. It is a Schedule 1 species as per the Indian Wildlife Act and vulnerable as per Indian Red Data Book. The food web shows the dependency between various species and the density of line indicate the dependency on particular locations. The human factors show excessive dependency on some elements which might have increased the commercial value of the place but has reduced its ecological value and led to an imbalance. The reason for this uh, decline in this region is intensive fish farming and orchard cultivation that has reduced the habitat of their prey and their nesting grounds. Being an apex predator, their restoration can also help in protecting other species. Earlier, the habitat of eagle was protected because it was considered as the protector by the local in their creation stories and their daily narratives. Also, both eagle and the local were interdependent on each other for foraging. This connect gives an incentive even today to protect their habitat and live in cohabitation. This storyline depicts the present condition and indicate that the older anchor sustain the basic necessities while the newer anchor overuse certain resources. Hence, there's a need to find alternate anchors that can sustain human in cohabitation with the landscape systems. The, protect, the project tries to tie knot between these different layers and imply that recognizing the importance of a species in the ecosystem and conserving their habitat can help the locals and the landscape. It brings the idea of reciprocity by attempting to protect the protector. These are some of the case studies 
and it was inferred from them that conservation and restoration is done by the local with the help of NGOs or government bodies that recognize this system by formulating broad level strategies and creating a prototype for some spatial implication. So this map shows the potential site to restore the eagle habitat out of which the lower and the middle estuarine area was chosen as a site since it can help complete its life cycle and it also connects both the systems. The site being on the coast experiences tidal inundation. The site acts as a floodplain and gives rise to wetland systems, mudflats, mangroves, and marshes. The system changed due to bunding that was required for fish farm and hence led to flooding in other areas. The flooding increased on the sand dune and hence an embankment was built to protect. This stopped the natural process of dune formation amongst other reasons. This led to reduction in species and the degradation of ecosystem. Since then, the eagle habitat has reduced. To understand these system, the site was de-led into these physical layers of topography, hydrology, soil, vegetation, and human activities. Two major layers of ecologically sensitive area and anthropological layer were overlapped to get the conflict map. For example, in this estuarine area where water during high tide or during monsoon used to flood the landscape is now bunded by narrow, is bunded and narrowed down to create an alternate system of fish farms, which leads to flooding in the settlement. To coexist with these natural systems, four strategies were taken to protect the existing system, restore the degraded ecosystem with the help of locals, construct memories through spaces that are lost, and enhance local technique for livelihood. So in the first zone, the primary strategy is to construct alternate system for retaining wall. As mentioned earlier about flooding in the settlement, the stone embankment was created to reduce flooding, but it disturbed the dune formation. Hence, natural embankment was proposed in areas which can be made out of porcupine units or wooden logs of Casuarina and Prosperous Julifora that can intertwine in each other and hold the sand, which can let the vegetation grow, that can help in flood reduction. Also, intervention in other zones will reduce flood in this area. In the second zone, the primary strategy was protecting by creating alternate barrier where Kajirina tree were planted to protect from storm and cyclone. Instead, mangrove or mangrove associated species can be planted. Space-wise removal of Kajirina or their leaves fallen on the ground will help the natural vegetation such as Ipomia aquatica, Cespatia, Populinia, etc., to grow on the dune, which in turn will create habitat for other species, such as turtle, which also becomes food to the eagle. The four dune planting includes species that are tolerant to salt spray and strong winds. The plain and the back dune planting helps hold the dune. Moving further to Eshirine area, the fish farm can be restored to create natural wetlands that can create habitat for many aquatic species and not depend on one species. This can also act as flood resilience. The locals can help in a way by deconstructing these bunds so that the natural flow of water can come in and create shallow depression for planting the native saplings to increase the breeding and spawning area for the aquatic fauna. Eventually, they can practice Kazan farming technique in this area for their livelihood. Further, near the road area and fields within 1.5 kilometer range from the shore, sluice gate can be provided to have control continuous access uh, and flow for the water system. So during high tide, the gate can be opened and even fish net can be put to catch fishes naturally. Orchards can be restored to riparian edges and mangrove associated forest. So these are the four processes that have been mentioned, uh, which can use these four uh, above mentioned four strategies. 
starting from removal of buns and casuarina in phase wise manner which can lead to flow of water to accommodate the sudden influx further planting along these water channel seasonal and perennial wetland condition can be created that will eventually create habitat for fauna such as fishes and crustacean that can help sustain this landscape and also create habitat for eagle to help these natural system provision for awareness center nursery hatchery have been done along this trail this leads to the master plan and the user and their activities as one can see there are areas such as protected mangrove area where humans are not allowed restored wetland areas uh, which will have restoration activity and trails for human awareness mangrove associated forest uh, these can replace the orchard at least in the ashrine area and awareness center for gathering discussion and spreading information restore sand dunes instead of casuarina plantation at least where settlement is not present so this master plan is designed for two conditions low tide and high tide to indicate the increased flood plain along with the ephemeral vegetation and how the site can in itself become resilient to the natural system this diagram shows the user and what would be their daily activities to restore and use this landscape this depicts the condition after few years of restoration so the project increases the ecological value of the landscape and play an important role at a systemic level it relooks at the common land and their relation with the locals it regenerates the species and resources that will support the local for their survival and livelihood in a way it will also bring back the pride within the locals these are some of the views through eagles eye view showing the restored habitat for fishes crustacean turtle restored wetland that can also make the system more resilient locals can also find livelihood in these areas instead of traveling to other regions the protected shoreline and some of the trails so to conclude these kind of similar intervention at systemic level can also be suggested on many such ashurine areas in the stretch of northern western ghat to protect from flood gain ecological services and live in cohabitation thank you thank you anuja we just witnessed how a project of this nature or genre can bring about a change at the systemic level by increasing the ecological value of the landscape being ashrine landscape being uh, in this context and bring back the lost connection of pride between the locals and the keystone species like eagle now moving on to our next presenter thanks so much yeah so our next presenter for today is uh, miss tanmay and she has a masters in landscape architecture from the school of planning and architecture vijayawada she will be presenting her thesis wetland restoration a case of nelapattu bird sanctuary a bird sanctuary in nellore in andhra pradesh um it falls into a category of palestrian swamp a land which is permanently saturated and filled with water her main focus would be to restore the ecological integrity of the wetland and establish habitable conditions for the birds so presently it's in a dilapidated state so she would be catering to that over to you tanmay you can start good evening all good evening i'll be presenting my screen i hope my screen is visible yes i yes I, now it is so, i would uh, be talking about my thesis topic that is wetland restoration and habitat rehabilitation a case of nelapattu bird sanctuary so firstly i would like to give a brief about my site so nelapattu bird sanctuary is a bird sanctuary that is located in a small village called nelapattu in nello district so the main importance of the site is that it is one of the last remaining breeding spots for spot billed pelicans and gray spilled pelicans and the site is not only important for its breeding ground but then it is an a resident ground for almost 189 bird species both migratory and resident of the site 
so looking at this map you could see this uh, agar pulikat bird uh, sanctuary adjacent to the site which is 30 kilometers away but then uh, that is a more of a brackish water thing and then nelpattu bird sanctuary is one of the last remaining freshwater wetland in nello district which is uh, lost its uh, value over the years so looking at this map you could see the nelpattu is a small rural setting you could hardly find any of the uh, infrastructure or amenities so the site is of 369 hectares of forest and then the remaining 84 hectares of wetland area so uh, the site changes its character over the seasons it is almost dry and uh, with dead barringtonia trees during summer and with it is almost flourished with breeding grounds of birds during the uh, monsoon season so i try to first understand the chronology that have happened over years so i have taken a uh, year from 1990 to 2020 and understood how the water level was gradually decreasing from 1990 to 2020 these are all the few site profiles so i would like to uh, show the few of the news articles that i've gathered over the years so you could see how the gray pelicans or other migratory birds have uh, lost their life or they have missed their migratory pattern due to loss in the quantity and quality of water on this site so this was the main issue that i would be focusing on my thesis but then i was also inclined to increase the uh, footfall on this site because the site is almost dead uh, after uh, two months so i wanted to have a distributed footfall on this site as well so talking about my methodology i have tried to collect data in two uh, sources that is primary and secondary i have also uh, taken few uh, survey on site as well then i have tried to analyze and then the design process i have tried to propose in two ways that is like design stage and guideline stage so talking about my literature i wouldn't be talking about my literature but then i wanted to give the key points on what was focused on the literature so i have tried to divide my literature in three parts that is wetlands avifauna and ecotourism as well so next talking about the case study so i'll just skim through my slides and then talk about the inferences at the end i have taken three case studies one at national level that is caladio national park which is similar uh, to my site in the restoration factor and the next one is uppalpadu bird sanctuary in guntur district of andhra pradesh it is very much similar in, in scale and uh, type of breeding ground in the, in such aspect and the third one was an international case study ogu wetland forest park all these case studies have given me an insight of what to do what not to do and what can be proposed on such eco sensitive sites so at the end i have come up with an inference table as in uh, what are all the uh, issues and threats that are found on this sites i have divided them into anthropogenic ecological and tourism and then i have tried to shortlist the strategies that are implemented on three uh, studies so at the end i have tried to infer and take away one thing that i would like to uh, tell here is that the even the case studies not everything that they have proposed were uh, in a right way so for example in uppalpadu bird sanctuary there was a uh, uh, a solution given to have a metal tree so that the trees uh, the metal trees are used for breeding grounds i don't think that is a feasible solution as a landscape architect to give so such were my takeaways from case studies so next coming to site analysis uh, as i told uh, there are many water bodies that are linking here that have lost their linkages over year that was affecting the wetland in directly or indirectly so this is a small user experience showing all the pictures so here uh, the setting is uh, morely of uh, natural trails where they have used only murram pathways all these things but then there was a more of impervious layer as one move forward so this is a small section showing how uh, the barringtonia trees uh, offer their uh, breeding grounds for 
birds. So I have also tried to understand climatic data because in this context, the climatic conditions have a strong relation with the bird migration. So I wanted to understand their long distance migration and to adapt to the conditions of this site so that the birds will not mix their migratory bird for the next season. So next I've tried to come up with few GIS maps. So this is a slope analysis where I understood the slope was uh, very minimal, that is zero to four percent. I would uh, relate this to uh, my next maps as well. So next I've tried to see hydrology map and then I've taken a veget NDVI map for four intervals that is 1990, 2000, 2010 and 2020. So with the same interval again I have taken the NDWI that is water index map. So now I have tried to interconnect all the maps from slope analysis, NDVI and NDWI. Now I could understand how the loss in vegetation cover was affecting the water directly because the site was not very steep. So the undulations were not much so that the water was not percolating as such. And then the wind, as a, uh, wind was acting as an agent for uh, reduction of water on this, all these things because of reduction in vegetation as well. So uh, further, I have tried to understand how the seasonality uh, was also affecting, then how the water occurrence uh, change intensity was happening from 1984 to 2020. So you could see there is a much of the change in water level. And then I, I tried to understand what was the root cause. And then we could see how the seasonality uh, seasonal change was an important factor for uh, change in water level. And then for further interventions, I've also tried to understand the flood area mapping to understand if it comes under the high risk or uh, medium risk zone of the water level. Further, I've tried to understand what are all the different activities. So as I told, the site is almost dead during the off season. And only during the migratory birds, you could see many people coming here and using this space for recreation and research. So I wanted to change that aspect. So finally, after all the analysis, I've come up with the concept to blend both the uh, human needs, that is anthropogenic activities, uh, without hampering the existing condition with the site. So I've come up with the concept of agro-tourism or agri-tourism so that the people who are residing adjacent, the settlements adjacent to the bird sanctuary could actually help in reviving or restoring the wetland as well as they have some economical uh, uh, value to them also. So I've come up with this concept, introducing agroforestry in their paddy fields as well so that the birds coming here, all the resident birds can also have an advantage uh, with the uh, human needs as well. So further, I've tried to start with mapping the issues at a macro level, and then I've tried to address each in particular. So here, uh, though I'm telling that I have taken uh, ecotourism or agri-tourism as my focus also, but then for me, the main stakeholders here was birds. So I've tried to understand their habit, habitat, food chain. So there are uh, many birds, water birds, arboreal ground birds. So I've tried to understand what are all the needs of different kinds of birds so that I could address all of them in particular. So this is my restoration map. So I've divided it into three parts, that is habitat, wetland, and forest. So I've, tr I've tried to address all the things where there is insufficient breeding spots and then the improper edge conditions and then the whole banks was with presence of juliflora that was also addressed. And then the presence of eutrophication was also addressed in such thing. So this is a small depiction at the corner showing the present and proposed condition. So uh, for the guideline stage, like I have, as I told, I've divided into three stages. That is wetland. Talking about the wetland restoration, I've come up with a few guidelines strategies for stakeholders and management as well as in like diverting the white uh, water runoff from the wetlands uh, to the wetlands from the adjacent to, uh, paddy fields and also treating the edge conditions and uh, reviving it with the nectar loving or a riparian buffer so that it would attract more number of butterflies and birds and also to have a two-stage ditch to avoid any flooding 
or to have water uh, persist in, in the site for a longer term. And here the stakeholders or uh, more of the local communities so that they can have a local participation at a broader level. Next, to have a habitat rehabilitation, I have come up with few of the awareness programs as guidelines and also to introduce more of native birds and native water species into the site. Next, for the forest revival, I have tried to come up with the concept of contour trenches because as I've told, the site is not very steep. So to have some undulations and to uh, let water percolate into the site, I've tried to come up with a contour trench concept. And I have given few guidelines for uh, stakeholders of government and uh, local participation as well. And with my one of my case study, I have understood that anticipating future challenges was also important. So I've come up with few guidelines talking about what might be the future challenges. I've come up with three uh, anticipated challenges. That is, there might be a chance of practicing aquaculture and then there, come, there might come an economic recession or a climatic change. So what we could do about it was the major uh, guideline or strategy, strategy that was proposed here. Then I have come up with the last layer of tourism potential map. I didn't want to disturb much of the site of bird sanctuary, but then I wanted to give that agri-tourism or agro-tourism outside the site boundary on the community level, uh, community space so that the people are more involved So and then they are economically benefited as well. So these are all the few. Uh, so now talking about zoning. So my zoning was having uh, different zones to have like a local resident zone, homestay zone, and then a uh, to give a urban local uh, to have more connectivity to their uh, rural roots where they could understand how the farming is done right from the beginning or uh, sowing to reaping. And then here I have given some few uh, trials as well. And then coming to ecotourism, I have divided it into two parts that is interpretative zone where the tourists can understand their tourist responsibility in such eco-sensitive zone through a trial so that uh, the natural setting of it is not hampered. And then I have just revived the existing trial of the bird walk. So this is the like different zones of the whole setting. So this is the agro-tourism zone I was talking about where I have an agro-experience trail amongst the paddy fields and then I have a guided farm to, uh, trail and then to have more uh, interaction with the locals I have come up with a multifunction zone where the telas or other things can happen. So this is a just zoomed in view uh, and to have more of this rural setting or to keep intact the existing value of the site I used all the local materials that are available in Mellow district only. And even for the lighting, I've only come up with the solar lighting so that it doesn't affect the birds or bird habitat during the, its migratory season. So here is a boardwalk I have proposed uh, in, into the interpretative trial where uh, I have added few uh, boulders or spill out spaces where in, uh, in regular interval so that they could have a natural setting while at the regular interval I have given up I could see the birds uh, at a larger scale or larger sculptures where they could understand the importance of birds uh, just not on the boats like the more local or attachment to the birds is given in that way so and then I have also given right, to interrupt you, Tanmay. you have another minute to wrap it up yes ma'am I am I am about to finish so even the bird watching towers I've given at two uh, levels so that they have a view towards different uh, levels of uh, birds that is arboreal, terrestrial, all the birds. And then this is the last bird watching trial. I've told, just revived it uh, by adding a deck so that and then the deck was proposed with bamboos uh, so that the people might not dump any waste into the water, but then they have a clear uh, connection to the birds. So finally, and then I was also uh, inclined to have more of plantation strategy, strategies. So uh, just because the site is adjacent to the uh, railway track, I've tried to come up with species that reduce or uh, uh, suppress the noise or pollution buffer. And then I have tried to propose trees that attracts more of birds 
uh, bees and then insects so that it could be a food ground for birds as well so this is all thank you thank you sanmay uh, we just saw how the strategies of issue identification and impact mapping has helped her derive the necessary intervention in the scenario and how she's prevented the habitat loss that was happening from uh, usage of these strategies so the last up for uh, this open day is ms shivani uh, satyajit kore and she has a masters in landscape architecture from shrimati kashibai navale college of architecture pune she'll be presenting her thesis wings and wetland a case of ujjayini dam backwaters on the bhima river in maharashtra uh, is she here uh, yes ma'am i'll just yeah. share screen yeah over to you yeah thank you uh is the screen visible yes yes so uh, good evening everyone first of all i thank isola bangalore for this opportunity to present my work on this platform i would also like to thank my college friends ceo and my guide architect neha muslekar for constantly supporting me in this journey uh is the slide changing uh yes i think so it's still on the first slide for me yeah just for me uh for me as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah now it's yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh irrigation has changed the face of india's countryside dry beds and stony uplands are replaced by sprawling reservoirs and farming greenery canals have brought water to parched lands and thirsty throats water is transported or lifted to drench Uh, the Ujjaini Dam is an earth cum imaginary gravity dam located on River Bhima. A river Bhima is a tributary of River Krishna that originates in the ranges of Western Ghat. Uh, the dam is among the largest dams in Maharashtra, situated near Ujjaini village of Sholapur district. Uh, the Ujjaini wetland came into existence in 1980. Before its formation, the area consisted of semi-arid marginal agricultural tracts and wetlands on the banks of River Bhima. Uh, the wetland was declared as Ujjaini wetland bird sanctuary on 20th October 1991 for conservation of birds and then uh, subsequently due to socio political pressures was re-reserved on 15th October 1992 uh, so the aim of the project is analyzing the shallow waters of Ujjaini dam backwaters uh, socio economic factors affecting migratory bird habitat and to develop systems for landscape management based on ecological parameters so the methodology is the background uh, is that the background study is done about understanding the fresh water inland wetland the study of bhima river from the origin uh, the factors of site like throw down agriculture transition phase and the fringes situations of the region uh, issue identification and impact mapping is done at regional level and a holistic management plan is given a site level project is focused on bird based ecotourism and habitat establishment for the birds Uh, so this wetland is part of the upper bhima basin located on the western sides of indian peninsula a river bhima is a tributary of river krishna and it originates in the ranges of western ghats uh, the bhima river dives through the deccan trap and comes to plains crossing four centuries with multi tiered forests to open vast deccan grasslands the course of the river widens and the sediments are trapped in the basin at this stage of the flow so there are about 26 villages surrounding the uh, study area and the shallow water region of the wetland so there is a difference of only uh, 5.8 meters between the full reservoir level and the minimum drawdown level showing that much of the reservoir is having shallow fringe area so due to this availability of vast shallow water uh, region ujjaini wetland wetland gains unique importance as a habitat for avifauna so it contains around a uh, species of uh, it contains inventory of 384 species of which uh, it can consists of 110 species of birds of which uh, 66 uh, 66 species are resident and 46 uh, 46 uh, species are migratory species the selected region of the study is an extreme landscape tract of very dry and very wet region uh, with maximum avifaunal population and maximum tourist footfall in the region so it is also a rural part of the three districts combined pune solapur and ahmednagar uh, the climate falls under the semi arid region with the forest type Uh, moist deciduous and tropical thorn forest uh, so this is the base map 
of the region. So, Uzni wetland has a unique geographical setting. It is situated almost centrally to the habitats uh, habitats of three most important species for which they are already declared wildlife sanctuary. So, these are the great Indian bustard, the chinkara or the Indian gazelle, and the black buck. These animals are spotted in the peripheral region, uh, almost in the vicinity of the wetland. So, farmers, fishermen communities. Uh, tourist uh, form a major, major part of the stakeholders in the region. The impoundment happened in uh, 1980 and 51 villages were submerged. Out of those villages, seven villages are located in the study area of the project. Uh, these villages resettle in the smaller tracts between the hill slopes uh, and the water ages. So, uh, first of all, uh, as a result of the availability of land, uh, availability. Uh, the land uh, reduced the uh, seasonal agricultural community. Uh, just a minute. Yes. So, uh, uh, as a result, uh, the availability of land reduced. Uh, the seasonal agricultural community shifted to pastoral society. Uh, the number of livestock increased. Uh, and the grazing ground shrunk. There was a considerable pressure on the hills for grazing agriculture and timber. This started the degradation of the hills. Uh, so there was a presence of alluvial soil before the impoundment and the water was flowing. Uh, the human activities were restricted to lesser availability of water, but this promoted more growth of grasses and, and food and shelter for mammals like wolves, back, uh, black bugs, grouse and Indian bustard. Uh, lesser livestock indicated lesser pressure on grazing. Uh, Semi-nomadic tribes like the Dhangars were dominant and they ruled the grasslands of Deccan. So uh, after uh, 1980, the riverine biome converted to lacustrine biome. The fertile soil submerged and the agriculture was practiced on lighter soils. The number of livestock increased due to shift in occupation. Fishing and animal rearing become a major occupation. Pressure on resources increased, availability of water in the ample quantity led to the cultivation of cash, crop, cash crops like sugarcane on hilltops, which further worsened the situation. Uh, the drawdown chart represents the arrival of birds, the water levels, and the seasonal activities of the region. The monthly water levels decide the nature of the fringe area, exposure of the banks, availability of forage, etc. The arrival birds and later their behavior, free, feeding, root, uh, roosting, nesting, etc. depends on the extent of drawdown. It is observed that uh, winter birds arrive late if water levels remain high. Even though uh, there are a lot of year-to-year -year fluctuations, the water starts receding to levels making water winter birds to arrive sometimes by mid-February and remain uh, low till mid of July. Lowest water levels are seen from May to mid-July. This is the best season of migratory avifauna. Even the breeding activity is restricted to this period. By the end of July, almost all chicks are ready to fly off. Uh, drawdown agriculture or gar pear uh, is practiced in this region, which uh, where seasonal crops are cultivated when the water recedes. So the uh, gar in regional language means silt and pear uh, represents uh, agriculture. So during winter, when water levels are still high, gar pear is less, but in summer, it is very significant. This leads to the release of potassium in water and the water quality degrades further. Uh, the, the drawdown affects the decomposition rate uh, of the plants. Uh, feeding patterns of invertebrates and low microphytes are present. Uh, so uh, in map one, this is the vegetation mapping done before the drawdown and after the uh, drawdown. So in map one, extremities of landscape can be seen. Uh, the landscape is a combination of scrubland and wetland. So dry deciduous vegetation plus wetland vegetation is seen. Absence of thick uh, vegetation is observed. No buffer between the wetlands and ag agricultural land is seen. Old native is lost and submerged in the water. No large trees in the settlements. Uh, streams are dominated by agricultural invasion. Uh, vegetation indicated tropical thorn scrub forest. The trees are thorny, spiny, with short trunks and low branching crown. Uh, vegetation shows paucity of uh, woody species, high percentage of annuals and low perennials, which indicates less plant vigor and less diversity of vegetation. In map two, uh, after the water recedes, the land is dominated by livestock. Uh, grazing takes place in larger scales near the water edges in summer rather than on the hill stops. Uh, drawdown agriculture is practiced. Farmers have got easier and cheaper options to pump water when their fields are closer to water body. 
fodder available on agricultural land is limited so pressure on common land is more cattle grazing uh, on the seasonal or permanent islands destroys uh, nest nests on the ground agriculture with drawdown region changes uh, changes in the region of the fringe area grazing of cattle and fishing activities has significant impact on the wetland uh, sugarcane cultivation dominates the agricultural landscape and bima falls in the uh, sugarcane belt of maharashtra so according to the upper bima basin plan prepared by uh, Water Resources Department of Maharashtra in Upper Basin. Uh, in Upper Bhima Basin, a whopping 19.27 percent of cultivated area is under sugarcane cultivation, which uh, amounts to be more than six lakh hectares. So the percentage of area under cash crop cash crop is more. Only small portion of land is devoted to cereals such as jowar and bajra, thus providing less fodder for cattle. Uh, there is cultivation of sugar on la- uh, light soil, uh, increasing salinity. There is absence of buffer between the agricultural lands and the water edge, is leading to ingress of fertilizer pesticides into the water. So over extraction of water is happen, uh, happens due to sugar cane. A detailed study of geomorphology, soil hydrology is done before coming to a conclusion. So for hydrology and uh, soil study, parallel lineaments are present in the region, which support transitivity and flow of water, and doesn't su- and doesn't support the percolation of water. Hence, there is a severe runoff from the hills and the grounds. uh then anti soil uh the anti soil uh, represents lesser uh, less horizon and is infertile molly soil in the soil is of grassland so these areas can be protected from grazing grazing and other activities and can be declared as no touch zones uh, insecticide soil promotes soil erosion and water logging in the regions vertisol expands and contracts so water logging uh, leaching happens in these areas these are highly saline and helps crustaceans to grow hence uh, flamingos visit this areas more uh cash crop cultivation is done on these soils uh which can be addressed so again uh soil depth soil texture and soil erosion uh is studied and uh, areas with severe, severe soil erosions are marked so these areas can be studied further uh, the chart represents various factors affecting the wetland ecosystems uh, the factors are interdependent with each, each other so areas with severe er- erosions need need to be addressed which are mainly studied on uh, which are mainly situated on the slopes various activities like grazing farming tourism tourism takes place in these sensitive areas cattle grazing in the basin of water body dis- disturbs the nesting of land birds uh, drawdown agriculture is disturbing disturbing the succession cycle of the wetland and it also affects the properties of the soil as chemical fertilizers are being used uh, weeds like prosopis jolifera apomia are affecting the fringes lesser grass diversity on the hills indicate overgrazing and degradation of grassland uh, water hyacinth and eutrophication uh, eutrophication havoc has increased in the past years absence of buffer between farmland and water body indicates uh, lesser space for what water birds to nest and rest uh, after issue identification site suitability is done according to soil type major focus will be given for buffer habitat establishment and zone ident- identification for further protection zoning for policy implementation is also done so uh, majorly uh, areas of grassland restoration wetland creation and nitrogen fixing plants is uh, identified tourism also takes place in these certain areas and that is also identified further so uh, uh, policies uh, are given capacity building should be uh, done before implementing the policies a multi stakeholder apro- approach should, uh, should be used involvement of community should happen and use of traditional practices can be done considering livestock rearing and crop choices employment generation to eco tourism grassland regeneration and watershed management can be done so policies for uh, land water vegetation and social uh, policies are given so policies of land consist of ban on grazing in the demarcated sensitive zones life fencing around the areas uh, demarcation of wetland boundary contour trenching and bunding can be done a uh, native vegetation plantation through social forestry and seed dispersal of perennials and other natives so policies of water consist of watershed management buffers along wetlands and streams dividing and control of uh, water quality and policies of vegetation are grassland glass, uh, grassland uh, revival wind break social forestry measures cutting management of grasses and weed removal the impact of watershed management on the region will cause changes in the soil moisture vegetation species land use pattern and vegetation biomass Uh, the plan is given after studying the drainage patterns of the region the groundwater prospectus and the soil typology of the region the policies are further worked upon and a holistic management plan of the region is proposed for, proposed for almost 30 years 
Now the slope revival revival will take around 25 to 30 years parallelly with the management plan. Uh, following are the proposed sections. of the region with interventions in the form of buffer is designed undisturbed island undisturbed island are created further inside away from tourist trails which can act as roosting and resting ground for the birds agroforestry systems are also proposed at the edges of the wetland to help reduce the stress on the water body and overall ecosystem a uh, section at dd represents the overall uh, interventions in the region which starts with the grassland restoration uh, the grassland restoration, re restoration on the hills with further agroforestry plantation conserved grassland water retention pond and then the undisturbed undisturbed bird habitat uh buffers for agricultural land and streams are also designed to prevent the inflow of pesticides and excess nitrogen uh, into the wetland these zones will also act as patches of habitat for water birds and ground ground birds as well the key consideration are increasing buffer widths uh buffer widths filling the gap and use of native after the interventions in the region further a zone is selected which is critically affected and design interventions are given for the zone so kumbarka and dumalwadi support support larger avifaunal population one major and one minor uh, heronary is present in the region the steeper slopes vary from the region uh, from the range between 16% to 20% where major degradation has taken place Uh, these slopes are not suitable for soil conservation as contour trenching or bending can worsen the situation more a vegetation vegetation cannot withstand the slopes they are due to absence of soil and rocky sheet flow mild slopes are suitable for for soil and water conservation studying the hydrology and groundwater potential further zone interventions are done where it primarily focuses on the buffers uh, here uh, the region was selected and the suitability analysis was done and policies were given for the scheme uh, Uh, now uh, the site uh, we come for the site level the site is situated at the main crossing of waterfall and grassland birds it uh, also a patch of varied habitats and, and is connected well with vehicular movements the area has excellent point to interrupt uh, you have two minutes to wrap up yeah. yes ma'am uh, just two slides okay. more uh, the area has excellent two points and a vast extent of existing vegetation the site will be exposed to plant ecotourism practices and bird human interaction zone the existing vegetation will be preserved Uh, the buffers will play a major role in the intervention so there will be uh, uh, various buffers for the bird habitat uh, zones so there will be island buffer wetland buffer uh, buffers along the core bird habitat uh, buffer for the walking trail and along agricultural fields uh, so the objective of the intervention are to form a mosaic of habitat on the reserve site and to replace the present uniformity of the of the area to lessen the severity of conditions create uh, created due to extreme dryness flood and uh, drawdown to design conditions where the riverine fishes will be able to spawn and waterfowl breed nest and rest to provide conditions where the bird use, uh, using marshes mud flats and shallow waters will be able to sustain to tackle the streams coming in the wetland and establish micro habitat for grassland as well as waterfowls so along with the bird human interaction zone individual bird habitat zone is provided which will Uh, remain untouched a buffer of 50 meters is provided between the human zone and the bird habitat zone fishing and boating will be restricted in this zone so uh, on the right side you can see an island design where uh, this will be a purely bird habitat zone and it it, it is a heronary which uh, which will act for uh, roosting and nesting of birds so uh, on the left hand side you can see these blue arrows where uh, the water starts receding in this direction so a structural stabilization of bank on the outward side uh, is given where uh, when the, uh, during the rainy season the water will come from this side uh, shallow areas towards the eastern side uh, are given considering the direction of sun because some birds also need sun uh, for their breeding uh, dense vegetation connecting main islands is also given grassland vegetation open areas for ground nesting birds uh, grasses connections between uh, two islands is also given parallel dikes to retain water during drawdown and stone exposed lands for soaking the sunlight and smaller mounds uh, to be constructed during foresting and uh, island position so the time of the year uh, arrival coincide with early summer late summer pre monsoon early monsoon and mid monsoon uh, period so this coincides with the uh, uh, water receding uh, water receding in the region so uh, further 
Uh, the edge profile of the eyeline is designed such that it will provide protection against the predators. Uh, dikes are provided at the periphery. The vegetation suitable for heronary is uh, provided, which includes acacia species native to the region. So the, uh, a management guidelines are given for uh, the heronary uh, presented before. So there will be a buffer development. So during the sensitive breeding season, a, a minimum buffer of 200 meters should be established, extending from the uh, peripheral uh, nests to the colony. Uh, some activities will be prohibited. Uh, pedestrian food traffic, recreational activities, including camping, bird watching, and photography, pets or livestock, uh, blasting, pipeline construction, and boating, agriculture that is known, trod on agriculture should be practiced. Aquatic buffer zone. So, during the sensitive breeding, an aquatic buffer zone of at least 200 meters should be established to protect heronary. A uh, management of colony site and buffer zone. No trees or shrubs, living or dead, should be removed from the colony prior or from the minimum buffer zone of the colony. Uh, guidelines for uh, persons entering heronary. Heronary should not be entered during the periods of uh, courtship, pair formation, uh, nest building or egg laying while the adults are incubating eggs or uh, brooding uh, young because of the danger of nest or colony abandonment. Artificial lightning. So uh, during night, no large artificial lights facing towards the sky to be used, which can disturb the heronary. Low lights facing downward should be used. Fire firecrackers to be banned. Uh, fishing. The engine of boats should be shut down if the fishermen are near the buffer zone of heronary. They should operate manually. Tourism. The tourists should not feed the birds, should not carry whistles during the visits. The colonies should be ob observed from weaving desks and watchtowers. No plastic packed items will be allowed. Uh, vehicles are not allowed in or near the nest or the site. It should be parked in the village and the site should be approached by walking. No activities at night are allowed in the site. So uh, this is the last site. So, uh, slide. So, for humans, provision for trails and race platform is given towards the bird in less populated areas. So, they are not allowed in the more populated areas uh, as well. Watchtowers are provided at the higher elevation of the site for birds, seasonally exposed islands, pools of calm water, cohabited areas, and heronaries are designed. Mild undulations on the ground creates resting areas for the waterfalls. So, the conclusion is uh, there is a clear uh, cut split between those who consider ecological importance to wetlands and those who primarily value water resource only as an instrument of economic growth. So even some leading technocrats and engineers believe in the idea of every raindrop must be used. Therefore, in the process of overutilization or uh, exploitation of all water resources, uh, ecological damage is inevitable. So this approach in the last couple of decades has created a situation resulting uh, into qualitative and quantitative degradation of all wetlands in the state. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, um, Shivani. Um, so we just um, came across um, a project wherein how a grassland revises uh, soil and water conservation strategies and agroforestry guidelines can actually act as crucial markers in restoring the ecological integrity of the wetland. So now we have come to an end. Uh, for the category bird habitats and also an end to the Isola uh, thesis presenters um, session. So we just saw three different contexts being explored in the bird habitat category. One was an estuarine wetland, the other was a pastoral swamp wetland, and the other one, the last one was a backwaters wetland. So they all had one um, approach in common, if I have to streamline that way. Uh, that the need to find alternate anchors to sustain the humans in cohabitation with the landscape systems. They all looked with overlapping physical layers to obtain the conflict map to further draw down the influences. So now if I can ask Shilpa Ma'am and Sandeep to switch on the audios as well, and our four presenters to switch on their videos so we can start with our uh, panel discussion. So, so Aditi, so, I, I don't know if our audience is the same as yesterday. So uh, we have a few new joins. Um, okay. We were uh, aware of it that a lot of people didn't uh, get an email of confirmation. So many of them. I was them... just wondering whether you know uh, what we discussed yesterday. We might end up repeating today. So I just hope that. Uh, so which is why I also wrote in the chat box that if the audience was participating, it would be nice because we might just end up repeating some of the stuff we said yesterday. 
I think we'll completely avoid the <laughs> questions and discussions that we had yesterday and stick to what uh, happened today. I think that no, but I do. I do have a point where I want to uh, kind of okay. take away from yesterday. Is that the only two um, non-landscape uh, uh, presentations, which was one yesterday and one today, mostly the urban commons. Right. I was just wondering why is there, you know, they are the ones who engaged with the urban and who engaged with people uh, and cities. So is there, I'd like to ask the landscape architects, are they kind of staying away from, you know, addressing what we are familiar with rather than talking of birds and other species whose behavior we are kind of second guessing. So any reason for staying away from the cities? I think I just want to add on a question to that. So they are all looking to increase the footfall into the yeah. wetlands and into the thing. But I think it just is going to cause a lot of nuisance because a lot of people are like unreasonably loud. Like, for example, if I asked my son, who is a toddler, he would love to spot birds, but it's just not possible. It's just going to create more nuisance and keep the birds away. So what was the reason, just to add on to your question, if you can answer this. Any of you would want to take it up? The four of you, presenters. Uh, hello. Uh, Oh, oh, one second, one by one. Talking I think. about the human interaction or the urban setting. So I think for the past few semesters, we have worked on the urban setting. Ma'am, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah but... Well, now you're not in case you're speaking. Sana, I think there is an issue with the it's network. Very, so we wanted to do something for nature and not for the humans. I think somewhere we are getting lost. No, I mean, uh, you know, this is a discussion. Okay, please don't take it uh, as a comment on your thesis or your work. It's, it's just purely a comment on uh, on what we saw yesterday and what we are seeing today. So... It's, you don't have to like say that you're getting lost or anything. You're, you're not getting lost. Just, just a question as to, you know, uh, why would you choose unfamiliar grounds or, or not? I wouldn't even say unfamiliar grounds. I would just say where it's so much more difficult to make a difference. It wouldn't, isn't it easier, you think, to set rules for human beings and uh, you know uh, select materials and select plants uh, rather than try saying that when the birds are nesting or they are uh, you know they you can't go there and which is which is something which is very very unfamiliar territory to us so i think it shouldn't be made so comfortable also in the wetlands so that you know everyone's invited only the people who are really <laughs> interested in spotting the birds should be um, you know approaching these kind of uh, yeah. like, that's my take on it um yeah so now uh, if i just want to add one more thing um in my case uh choosing that site and leaving people's perspective a little aside was because it was in a rural setting and um, there yeah. was already a connection that was built between the biodiversity and the people who were staying over there. So yeah. looking sorry, at... sorry to interrupt you, Anuja, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Anuja, I saw your. I never got through where your site is. I I went through your entire presentation earlier also, and today also you named one river, but I just couldn't place where your uh, site is. Uh, the site is about 150 kilometers from Mumbai, if okay. that's how you can place it. It's uh, in the peripheral region. In uh, Gujarat or in Maharashtra? Uh, towards Gujarat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it lies between the industrial areas and uh, those places are getting industrializing and changing over time. But there is a connection that we still see. And uh, that is why uh, restoration was one of the attempt of going towards uh, uh, building that interaction between people and the biodiversity to retain whatever landscape we can. 
uh, instead of completely shifting towards uh, human dominated landscapes so so who owns the land uh, that you are talking about that you know when we tell them you can do away with kasuri or should do away with kasurina or you know change the vegetation how do we know that it is not a part of their livelihood and they may be averse to the idea of uh, you know what you are trying to advise yeah so some of these areas are government areas since this site also became a uh, ecological fragile area in 1991 and some of the areas were common lands to people uh, so wherever i have proposed intervention i've tried to use those common lands only or the government lands so that the government can take initiative other than uh, uh, intervening into public uh, say private lands so private lands uh, we can only provide guidelines as to what people can do uh, but not propose an intervention over there do you think and i think question is for all okay and i'm sorry i'm just venting my angst uh, do you think a government which is developing the mumbai delhi expressway and the mumbai nagpur expressway uh, is going to even listen to what you are trying to do uh, you know kind of going back to nature that doesn't seem to be uh, the perspective with which uh, the government organizations are seeing our uh, natural habitats so uh, if i have to say uh, this uh, government always looks at a little bit of economy generation yeah, and if generation. yeah so if there's a win win for the people the government in terms of economy but it's done in a more sustainable way then they might even look at it okay hey sandeep you want to and uh, thank you so much shilpa for that uh, question and for you know kind of uh, putting across this point because i was also thinking of the same uh, while i was going through the presentations but then what I kind of quite liked was the fact that these projects were very ambitious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no, knowing probably that you know these could not lead to an answer, or you know, probably not even you know, and and like Chilpa rightly said, they're not even a complete picture because as landscape architects, we are trained only to look at certain aspects. Our exposure with landscape architecture has only been for the last one and a half years or so, and then suddenly we are pushed into a thesis project. So. Um, one is the ambition you know so i think that was tremendous and like chilpa uh, uh, you know made a point yesterday you know like we need to be vocal and we need to be able to speak about these things at the right venue i think that's what she was trying to push uh, even today you know while she was asking you the question of do you think the government would listen uh, you know i'm i'm sure we all know the answer but then the point that she was probably trying to make was that you know that as landscape architects we should be in a position to be able to discuss these things you know push for these so when we get a project tomorrow uh, to 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 be a part of a highway design team then maybe rather than just looking at it as avenue planting versus you know ground cover shrubs and uh, you know trees or just ticking off the eia norms of you know 40 trees per acre or whichever is the norm right now uh, you know probably there there is a there is a different way in which we can even question the whole alignment of the road or we can you know a question a lot of these things so yes i mean um, you know these are answers i mean questions which we don't have an answer for right now but yeah i mean but these are definitely food for thought also That's how... with you is uh, tulsi yeah to tulsi yeah she's here okay yeah so see that was also very commendable for an undergraduate thesis to you so, know start from a yeah. urban ecosystem perspective so that's really nice um were you asked to i mean did you attempt to also i just found that your solution eventually was very plan driven in the sense that you know you got the nala and the wetland and but did you because you are largely you know doing an architecture design did you look at how the buildings uh, could play a role in that ecosystem like whether it is from you know the building material perspective or even from the heights of the buildings or how they engage yeah. it was kind of it felt like there are two separate layers one is the site plan and then the buildings 
Uh, yes, ma'am. I try to uh, incorporate the element of architecture and uh, the detailing. Like, uh, so the overall idea of proposing a mixed use. So it was uh, not like a traditional mixed use that we uh, see wherein like a larger complex there are different buildings. But the idea was to integrate all of these uh, ideas at uh, an architectural level as well, wherein th the impact that the building has on site it is uh, also reflecting this overall idea of self sufficiency or uh, looking at the site as an ecosystem. So be uh, be it uh, in terms of uses or uh, in terms of the uh, how the building is functioning and uh, in terms of materials uh, I did not uh, particularly go into the material aspect uh, like in terms of uh, details but uh, it, there was just a very sp uh, specific intervention uh, wherein like I uh, uh, mentioned about using uh, econ econ economically and ecologically viable materials within the context of uh, Delhi so I'm uh, from an architectural point of view uh, like this was uh, the details uh, like uh, these, these were the areas wherein i tried to incorporate these uh, ideas with so the overall theme. what ma'am is trying yes. to say is uh, all of these nalas have like a standard buffer zone that needs to be given yes so what yes, the built fabric um being positioned in this site was it like allowed in terms of uh, the plan uh, the master yes, plan or this was taken up individually like a site okay let me you know get this for my thesis mm. was it that kind of uh, ma'am actually it was a combination i would say like it was a combination so the land is government owned and uh on a portion of site, it is uh, proposed that it can be commercial or mixed use. But uh, then there is a significant like uh, area like which is known as the recreational uh, zone in the uh, Delhi master plan. So it does not allow uh, like uh, uh, permeable, like impermeable or uh, actual prominent construction on the site. So it was a mix of that as well. So I did not try to challenge the proposal or of the master plan that is given. So uh, I just incorporated that idea into my thesis, like uh, because uh, like like we were uh, having that discussion earlier about uh, government interventions. So respecting the government's norms as well uh, was one of the ideas. So I did not uh, challenge that, uh, uh, rather incorporated those uh, uh, guidelines or those um, you know those the area demarcations that are present into my own thesis. Hmm. Uh, Tulsi, uh, actually, um, yes, you know, sir. since you started. You started with this whole question of urban interdependency ecosystem model, if I remember yes, it right. Yes, uh, you know, sir. I think as an academic uh, project, it would have been it would have been great if you could, you know, kind of question the FSIs, you know, the the imagined um, uh, restrictions on a certain parcel of land or a master plan imagination, which may not have really taken the ground realities into cognizance. So, I mean, that, that would have been an opportunity uh, for you to kind of, you know, uh, look beyond. Not just you, I mean, all these projects which basically look at such sensitive um, mm -hmm. sites wherein there is an imagined master plan imagination, which is already there. Uh, so, in, in reality, in real life, maybe questioning them and, you know, kind of moving forward may be much more difficult than in an academic setting. And it's also, it's also kind of a, a practice or setting up a new, uh, you know, experiment which can then possibly be taken up as a professional later on. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, my next observation was uh, they have all implemented ephemeral uh, design strategies against uh, something which is like permanent or uh, having that kind of a prominence. So, what, is, what would be your take on this, starting off with Sandeep? Uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, the whole, like yesterday, I think we had a long discussion on this question of uh, permanence versus ephemerality in, in in our uh, in our inputs for uh, the sites as landscape architects, so I think that way is I was kind of happy to see a lot of these projects not resorting to building huge parking lots and you know permanent structures or overlaying uh, a regimental grid on a highly dynamic landscape, but rather moving along with what is there, and also this question of uh, addressing seasonality. And there again, I reiterate, you know, the the power of drawings. So, I mean, we could see some beautiful drawings today, you know, wherein the whole questions of seasonality were, um, you know, addressed. So, so was the case in some of the projects yesterday as well, to give uh, due credit. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that was quite encouraging, uh, in, uh, you know, for me to um, see. I also had um, uh, one or two concerns regarding the same. So, for example, we are in a highly technology-based uh, era, right? So... Earlier, if um, our um, focus was about 
the heavy reliance on engineering and technology right now the reliance seems to be at least in the thesis level the reliance seems to be on uh, on gis technology or you know like uh, on the different aspects with which we look at it so many of these studies actually looked at uh, nbdi for example like the normalized difference vegetation index or nbwi you know so you have maps from so and so era and so and so era and then we say okay the green area has increased or decreased or whatever but i think what we miss out in these larger observations that we make and you know we kind of make them concrete by drawing out is that are we looking at okay the vegetation would have increased but are we really looking at the quality of this vegetation or is it and and every site at least out of the three projects that we saw uh, two of them did mention prosopis juliflora an invasive species kind of being a problem in the site right so it's quite possible that the increased vegetation was because there was an invasive plant that kind of took over the landscape so um i i i i would have loved to see a bit more of in depth uh, you know kind of introspection into those aspects of was it prosopis juliflora that led to this increase or okay my nbdi map says you know there is an increase so that's a positive thing you know? so i mean questions like that um you know kind of came up while i was looking at the presentations so yeah, yeah. so for yeah. any of you able to, oh, sorry sorry adit you were saying something No, no, I was just asking you to. Oh, I just it? wanted to yeah. ask uh, everyone: Were you all able to visit your site and actually map any of these conditions, like what Sadeep mentioned? You know, because again, they're very, very large areas, and um, again, it's a six-month or I think it's a four-month thesis semester, and uh, probably the seasonality and all of it is not really, you know, perceivable. It's all. like he said gis data probably so how could you really you know visit the site talk to the people people who are living there the you know um so or is it purely uh, you know secondary research uh hello ma'am yeah uh, yeah in my case i actually belong to the area which i studied okay so i belong to that area and i actually have seen the transition of the landscape since years so i actually documented uh, those seasons from december uh, to uh, the end of february so my viva uh, was in may but in february i documented all the seasons and before that prior i knew uh, the birds the timing the arrivals and then what happens in that region uh, so um, like my grandfather or uh the older people in the regions i uh, interviewed them so they used to tell like this was a, a river uh, uh it was a river and we used to drink water from that river and now it is a backwaters of a dam and we are not even allowed to eat fishes of, uh, in that uh, region so this is a major difference that can be seen in that area and uh, it is a very contrast like uh, if we are away from the uh, water edge we don't even know that water uh, is present in that area like it's so uh, contrasting so when you are on the road you you can't find the water or the uh, what we can say the proximity of water so it's that harsh and uh, talking about the uh, processes or the epomia uh, which uh, sir mentioned about the uh, uh, increase in the vegetation part so it has probably increased but in my case uh, the old native vegetation has submerged and these uh, new vegetation uh, followed uh, due to uh, the siltation and the seeds which it which it uh, brought from the upper side of the river so the siltation happened and the uh, seeds were sown and this was a transition period of around uh, 40 to 50 years uh, where the riverine biome changed into lacustrine biome but uh, the vegetation is still in that um, transition phase so the wetland is still in the transition phase the initial transition phase because uh, after every six months the cycle is repeated so uh, some uh, uh, tree or some vegetation can't handle the harshness uh, in the summer so they die and again they germinate and they again die in six months so this is the process that is uh, repeatedly happening for uh, last 40 to 50 years so uh these are some things that need a lot of time to document and understand so in my case i had some background study so for that it was possible for me to understand this process 
I think with respect to Anuja's project, with respect to Eagle, if it was like if the awareness is brought about with the local community, we have seen people being extremely attached to these kind of uh, old notions or it's extremely close to their heart. So I think to an extent, the community involvement will happen in that project per se. So, yeah. Uh, so is that I have one, one, last, uh, one last question. Uh, so all of you have probably finished your thesis in April, May, maybe maximum June, and it's already like six months to that. So do you find uh, any of like your thesis, you know, uh, seen in your it's professional work? Are you doing that kind of work right now? Or does it inform the way you think? I think we should ask the other four presenters also from yesterday to yeah. join us. Uh, yeah, if they're there, on the be video. Nice. So I'm sure they would have also entered the professional field. And, uh, I, I think they're there. I could see the names. In the yeah. Um, I would love to hear Nitin. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. So Mama. would you want to? Yeah, Shreya and Rajeshri as well. Yeah, Shreya and Rajeshri. Ma'am, uh, like if we talk about what, um, like if we are taking that forward or not, so currently I'm working as a, in the capacity of an assistant professor only. So okay. taking that into account just after doing my thesis is one um, learning for me and uh, taking that uh, further and spreading it, whatever I could learn and giving it back to the students that I teach today is one thing that, I mean, as architects or as landscape architects, the primary thing that we all have been talking about is voicing out and awareness. <clears throat> so the easiest way for me could be to spread what I've learned and what I've researched. So that is the, that is the first thing that I'm trying to do. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'll, yeah actually, I'm okay. Uh, actually, I am also having a similar situation. I am uh, working as an assistant professor. So um, while seeing uh, people designing certain things or their approach to their thesis and then guiding some of the some of the people, my perspective goes uh, from an architect to a landscape architect. So whatever I have learned in these years, I try and teach them like you are thinking as an architect, but this can be a solution. So giving people what I have learned in these years, these two years, is a major thing that I'm doing right now. Uh, but uh, it's sad that I'm not able to work more on the landscape perspective in the field itself. But in future, that can... Yeah, happen. don't. nothing is sad. It, everything is, uh, you know, uh, there's a new beginning. And I mean, everything is a learning uh, experience, right? So nothing yeah. is sad. You just... You're just out into the profession and you have a long, long way to go. So, yes, yes, ma'am, definitely. Uh, we have someone from the audience uh, named Swati, and she's a landscape architect who has been in the field for six years and she would want to present her views for the same. Uh, please join in, Swati. We would love to listen to your take on this. Um, how is she here? Hello? Swati? I think she's turned on her mind. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, please. Yes, we can. Uh, uh, hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, firstly, I would just like to extend my thanks to all the presenters. They presented really inspiring thesis. And and uh, it's just such a marked dip, uh, departure from the kind of projects that we work in practice, really. So a lot of the projects uh, that we come across in uh, professional practice are commercially driven, and we don't really come across many ecologically driven projects. So uh, uh, looking at all these theses and taking back from yesterday's discussion also, I just again maybe I'm maybe bringing out uh, yesterday's uh, points as well that who are the correct people to reach out to really translate 
all these uh, projects into reality where we're talking on, on a regional scale and a larger scale where um, a landscape architect is engaging in a scientific process and proposing a, a you know a, a scientific solution or an intervention so a lot of these projects involve intervention with just the local communities so just to you, you can say maybe as an initiative can we just reach out to such communities or uh, even the panchayat maybe and start with small parcels of land and bring about a change and set that as an example uh, for the government or the bureaucrats who maybe can realize our potential and uh, uh, and and so on and so forth it may lead to a change so this is just my take uh, i mean everyone is uh, free to present uh, their views on it Uh, because uh, if we come across projects uh, today, a landscape architect is presented with a, you can say, maybe a residential township or a, you can say a, like a mall or an office building where a driveway is laid out and you just have uh, the role of a landscape architect is, uh, you can say, limited to manicuring the space. So l this is... Uh, and we're talking in our education system, we're talking about a much larger scale. But when we step into professional practice, we don't really address, uh, uh, we don't get to address these cases. So uh, your take actually, on this, uh, Shibli. Actually, I can see um, a big shift in Bangalore. Yes. So this, I've been in the profession for right. like 10 years now. So mm -hmm. initially, like how you said, we were treated as the gardeners, so you know, the manicurists and yeah. stuff like that. But now I can see people calling in us to site the buildings, like in a site, like as landscape architects, we are calling to site the buildings and then take it forward. So all these yeah. studies of all the physio uh, physical layers or physiological layers, they're helping us to site those buildings yes. and see how the rainwater population can happen, we can aid in it. So might not be at a huge and large scale like the way we would have done our thesis, but mm -hmm. in a much micro level and sub micro level, if I can call it, um, I can uh, personally uh, see a change. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And to add to that, I would also like to share my experience. Like. I have got an opportunity to work with urban design and urban planning firm, um, which actually take this landscape approaches and uh, they put the ecological layers and all the layers that we actually study in college into the design. So there is a shift as Aditi Nam said, and uh, it's interesting to work in different uh, sector collaboratively and co take the landscape uh, approach ahead. But like Shilpa Ma'am told, with respect to the public government body, I haven't seen a change, frankly, because the government shifts. Whenever we want to present something, the government changes, and it's all, again, back to ground zero. So I think I would like to add to that, because right now I'm working with Andhra Pradesh government. So I think like I have a drastic change from my thesis to the work that I'm doing right now because I was very sensitive towards ecology and all those things in my thesis and I'm a drastic change where um, not even a single tree is taken care of and like it's just all the human needs that we are addressing right now. So it is little hurting right now. Tanmay, then probably you are our... Um... Like, little change has started. Like, people at least tire off. But at least I think ecology is also given, like, minimum importance at this point. So Tanmay should be our middleman to showcase the works to the government and, you know, see that... Be the, be, the, be the change you want to see in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, on a lighter note, or give trees voting rights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's a joke. laughs> 
<laughs> no, but you know, there's some fantastic work now coming up from the Delhi Development Authority yes. where they have done these biodiversity parks. So I think, and those are government organizations and they have a very, very oh, diligent and hardworking landscape department. So Tanmay, I think you have hope. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, I think eventually we are not going to have a choice. Uh, we will have to turn back to nature. I think, like I said yesterday, I think as landscape architects, we're probably more blessed to realize this earlier than the others. Yeah. But eventually, I think we it's a no-go. We will have to turn back to nature. So at that point, I think we will hopefully be the ones to make a bigger difference and at least be equipped to, you know, uh, make a difference. So yeah. hopefully, ma'am. Yeah. And yeah. to also know what teaching. I mean, I it, it's great to teach, but I would also say that uh, jump a little bit into practice. Maybe you should also ask. Maybe you know have like a consultancy cell in your college or take up some small work. There is that is a different world, and you will be able to inform your students better if you also engage with practice, because that's where we can actually make a lot of difference. Of course, you can make a difference by teaching correctly and, you know, as well, but you get a chance to uh, do practice. I think uh, we are lucky, okay, to, we're lucky to be equipped with the knowledge that we have. So it's very, it sounds very, you know, assistant professor, or, I, I'm doing that, I'm teaching myself and I, I taught after 20 years of practice. I have moved to full-time teaching now. But um, I, I do think that those years of practice help me uh, in some way. Or, yeah. So do, do try. I mean, everyone has their own decisions to make. You may be more interested in research. You may be more interested in academia. But that little brush with practice is always helpful. Yeah. So that. Okay. So yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, there was, there was one more point. I mean, uh, you know, while Shilpa had asked the question earlier about how many times or how well were the students kind of well-versed with their sites, I think that also brings up a very interesting uh, point, Shilpa, you know. Maybe the way landscape architectural thesis itself is formulated in, in India, you know, that itself probably needs a sort of a rehaul because I remember when I was a student at SPA Delhi in 2004 to six. at that time we had a professor uh, who in our plants and design class would basically encourage us to go out in the city and click photographs and make sketches of the same scenery yeah. over the months. And many of us would actually sneer and say, oh God, you know, like nothing changes there. But in reality, by the end of the year, we could realize that, you know, there are very fine, but then very, very noticeable changes which are actually there. So, and that was a great learning for me, which I kind of adopted when I started teaching plants and design later. So I think you're right, you know, the six month engagement with thesis and especially as landscape architects, you know, it kind of gives a very incomplete picture in their understanding. So I think that's one slip which probably needs to be addressed. Uh, I think many architectural colleges do that, you know, they have yeah. uh, in the odd semester a dissertation that then culminates into their thesis project in the next semester. So eventually they do get a, a whole Good year job. of yeah. engagement. Yeah. And that's one. Secondly, also this, uh, this discord between what happens in the profession versus what is being taught. Because as academicians, we know we have to provide the ideal situation or the ideal solution. You know, that's, that's where our focus kind of lies. But what happens outside in the real world, you know, should students get a shock when they go out. So this engagement with the larger world or with the real profession, you know, if that can also be somehow intertwined into the academics. I think that will make a real big difference in the way thesis projects are seen. But I think that's a discussion probably for all of us, you know, yeah. for all of us to take up probably for ISOLA to kind of, you know, uh, yes. take it up. Yes. Yeah. I think in uh, the university, you're taught how to question, like how exactly to question the happenings. And that somewhere helps uh, once you dive into the professional uh, field, because without that, you would be like having no other go. So I think that is what is going to help them. So this was not to discourage any students over here. This is just a discussion. 
because we hardly get chances like this where we can discuss, have dialogues. Like for example, this forum is, I think we are having a lot of students, architects, um, mm. practicing offices presently who have joined this. Yeah. I think it would be great if we can throw it open to the public so that more awareness is created among them so they would think twice of their actions. Yeah. So I think now we'll conclude the things open day. And uh, thank you, Isola, Bangalore chapter, me being a part of it too. So, yeah. So over to Rashmi. So we can conclude on this. Thank you, Aditi. Okay, I would like to extend uh, thanks to all the participants on both days who had, you know, a lot of enthusiasm in presenting their work and being a part of the panel and also providing an opportunity for this great discussion. I would also like to thank um, Sandeep Menon and Shilpa Chandavaka, ma'am, for uh, spending your valuable time with us and being part of this discussion. Uh, thank you, Aditi for being with us on both the days. And uh, a special thank you to uh, Dilip uh, for managing uh, and coordinating both the sessions and Kanchan for all the help in the posters and you know getting things done on time. I'd also like to um, extend uh, thanks to Smriti, Sachin and Maitri for their constant uh, support. Last but not the least, I would like to thank uh, the managing committee of Bangalore chapter and uh, with this, I would like to conclude uh, Thesis Open Day version 7. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rashmi. It's a brilliant initiative, and I really enjoyed myself. I'm hoping it's in person and you'll call me to Bangalore someday. Definitely. <laughs> well, I know this is much easier because you can get, uh, you know, students from everywhere to participate. So I know the first couple of them were in Bangalore and I think the last three years have been online. It's a wonderful initiative. It's really nice. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Rashmi, for actually having us. And uh, contrary to what Shilpa said, I would love it to be an online event. Otherwise, it will be impossible for me to actually be a part of it sitting here. Okay, in you can invite us, Sandeep. We can have it where you are. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to, seriously. Yeah, because there is so much of learning for me as well. You know, when I go to universities here and, you know, kind of see how things, the process, you know, how things are kind of different from what we do in India. So, yeah, I'd actually love to. So, you know, definitely, definitely we look at the possibilities. But thank you, Isola Bangalore for this. And thank you, Rashmi and Aditi. And thank you, Shilpa, for being a wonderful co-panelist. And thank you for all the students who presented their work. I mean, yes. the professionals who were students who presented their works. You know, please don't take our comments personally because what we were looking at was the fact that, you know, if your thesis did, you know, did ignite a discussion, I think that itself is a great opportunity. So thank you so much for that. And looking forward for the next year. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.